Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The Islamic Republic of Iran is suffering from several overlapping crises, which brought about public approval of Tehran authorities to a new low. While Iran faces one of the most severe consequences of the corona pandemic, its Revolutionary Guards Corps defied international scrutiny by conducting a successful launch of a military satellite, an obvious signal of missile capabilities, all the while ignoring American warnings to stop harassing the U.S. Navy in the Persian Gulf and Straits of Hormuz. What are the reasons for the regime's behavior, and is an American-Iranian clash inevitable? Joining our broadcast from Jerusalem is Brigadier General Yossi Kupelwasser, who is a project director on Middle East developments at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Welcome. Thank you. Also joining us from uh, Central Israel is Dr. Eran Lerman, who is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and a lecturer at Shalem College. Welcome. Good to be back. Indeed, and I'd like also to welcome here in Jerusalem our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren. And once again, to immediately dive into uh, today's program, what is the situation right now with Iran? We'll privy to uh, the latest developments pertaining to its satellite launch and uh, its uh, aggressive conduct. All the while, the situation domestically is uh, uh, terrible, a lot worse what, uh, than what the Iranian regime is actually letting on to the World Health Organization and so on. Indeed. So here we are some two months after the coronavirus uh, hit Iran um, and caused a very severe crisis with at least 15,000 people dead, according to the best information uh, we have uh, in Israel. But we are also uh, exactly six months before the presidential and congressional elections in the United States, the presidential election uh, most probably pitting Donald Trump, uh, who is vying for re-election against the Democratic uh, candidate uh, Joseph Biden. Uh, and obviously Biden, uh, being uh, Barack Obama's vice president, has a totally different view of the relationship with uh, Iran than uh, uh, Trump uh, has. Now, um, the developments which you referred to are basically the uh, launch of the military uh, satellite, uh, which of course has a reconnaissance value of its own. Uh, it uh, would give, not uh, immediately, but it would later on, uh, would give Iran uh, some measure of independence in its reconnaissance activities. But uh, more importantly, if you have a satellite launcher, you have a missile, a ballistic missile, because the third stage of the missile the uh, uh, so-called uh, passenger of the vehicle could be a warhead rather than uh, a satellite. So that uh, uh, should concern all of uh, Iran's uh, uh, neighbors um, and uh, um, adversaries. The other uh, important uh, development has been uh, President Trump's warning to Iran that if uh, the um, Revolutionary Guard's uh, naval force uh, keeps harassing the uh, uh, naval units of the uh, U.S. Uh, Fifth Fleet um, in the Persian Gulf or in the Strait of Hormuz, uh, he will order the Navy, uh, as he said, to shoot down as if uh, the vessels are uh, in the air. But this is uh, just... Uh, he actually said blow out of the water. No, no, he said shoot down, shoot down. Uh, shoot down the, uh, uh, the vessels. Um, and uh, what we know, in addition to what uh, Trump said, is that there are indeed contingency plans held by the various uh, commands and uh, units of the uh, U.S. Armed Forces um, to start uh, a multi-domain operation, uh, which could be um, naval, air, cyber, and even some ground elements, some, some raiding elements. Uh, we are now marking the uh, 40th anniversary of uh, the failed operation Eagle Claw. Uh, better known as Desert One, Desert One being only the landing strip uh, where the uh, operation failed. And uh, the Iranians uh, are probably not going to goad Trump into making good on his uh, warning. So there are tensions, but as we are inching towards the uh, November elections, 
there will be less and less incentive for the Iranians to test Trump's resolve. Indeed, as they're supporting his uh, uh, political adversary, uh, General Kupelvasa, I'd like to ask you the next question. Considering the fact that the United States, uh, together with other countries around the world, have tried to uh, uh, convince Iran to abandon their so-called malign activities across the Middle East and elsewhere uh, by uh, exhausting pretty much every type of power in, in the toolbox, including diplomatic power, soft power, uh, economic power for that matter, uh, at what stage will the United States administration, uh, under the leadership of President uh, Donald Trump, if at all, uh, decide to complete the box by also uh, introducing uh, strong power, which ultimately will bring about smart power and maybe convince the Iranians? Well, first of all, the Americans have used uh, hard power, and uh, you can ask uh, Mr. Soleimani. Uh, he will attest to that. Uh, and uh, when necessary, they did. And I think the, the uh, policy of the Americans is to avoid running into some sort of an attrition war with the Iranians. They don't have anything to gain from an attrition war. So they use their uh, capabilities and their uh, military might in order to explain to the Iranians what are the limits of what they can uh, play with and uh, get away with it. But at the same time, and explain to them that if they cross those limits, then the kind of uh, hit that they are going to suffer is going to be really hard. And uh, they did it with the uh, Soleimani case, and uh, this is the threat that the uh, Americans have uh, issued now in regard to the harassment by the boats in the in the Persian Gulf, or the Arab Gulf, uh, you can choose. And, uh, and uh, this is also true, I think, although the Americans don't use this uh, yet, in regards to other uh, areas, such as if the Iranians cross the, the line on the nuclear level, on the nuclear issues, which is the most important uh, re relevant uh, area. There are other areas where the Americans prefer to use the uh, maximum economic pressure tool, which they believe is effective. And, uh, for example, when it comes to uh, uh, moves that the Iranians do on uh, long-range missiles and uh, on, uh, harassing uh, their neighbors and all these uh, matters that the Iranians are, the Iranians are still uh, working on a very wide spectrum of uh, activities that uh, challenge the United States, on all these matters, the American response is economic pressure. But in the coming uh, uh, month, they have several uh, challenges that they will have to use more diplomatic pressure than what they used so far. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be problematic for them to do that. Uh, first of all, on the issue of the uh, embargo on uh, arms procurement for, uh, for Iran that's going to uh, get to an end uh, in the coming month, in October. Uh, the Americans will have to find a way to uh, make sure that uh, the international community still sticks to this embargo. It's, uh, it's very important. And also on the issue of missiles, in my mind, eventually they will have to uh, build some international uh, coalition that would put pressure on Iran to, to stop this project, uh, because this is a threat not to Israel and to the immediate uh, vicinity of uh, Iran, but to Europe and the United States. And that's something of a different nature, that, uh, and that uh, I think they can hope to have some more cooperation from the Europeans. Mm. Well. Uh this raises a few questions. Of course, uh, the uh, use of uh, strong power vis-a-vis -vis Qasem Soleimani uh, did uh, take place in, uh, in response to Iran's uh, malign activities. But ever since then, there have been uh, every week pretty much uh, rocket attacks uh, in the green zone in Baghdad. Uh, against uh, U.S.-led uh, coalition targets, including installations in uh, different areas uh, uh, across Iraq, all of which uh, is uh, known and, and corroborated to be attacks either by Qatab Hezbollah, which is an Iranian uh, proxy, as well as uh, uh, other situations, as uh, was mentioned both by you, General Kupilvasar, and Mr. Oren, uh, ongoing malign activities uh, in the Persian Gulf or Arab Gulf, uh, however, uh, the perspective allows one to call this place 
uh, in order to uh, really signal out the Americans as the aggressor or so on that the regime is uh, uh, trying to do. But uh, Dr. Lehrman, I'd like to ask you specifically, the launch of a, uh, a vehicle capable of carrying nuclear weapons and using such technology as is stated uh, uh, in UN Security Council Resolution 2231 as, as forbidden, call it calls upon or using all kind of terminologies uh, is just for uh, Iranian purposes, if you will. Is this situation not a red line for the international community at large? Well, um, the international community has shown over the years a uh, <clears throat> worrisome capacity to ignore ira aspects of Iranian behavior. And uh, there are many players, specifically in Europe, who are still trying to treat Iran as some kind of a legitimate interlocutor. But I believe that uh, this act, which, by the way, reveals the role of the IRGC in the presumably uh, peaceful um, space program of Iran, or, or the, the, uh, uh, the, what they have pretended to present to the world as a peaceful program. Um, I think this is part of a larger pattern that has already brought even Europe to the point of uh, making the judgment that Iran is in breach of its international obligations under the JCPOA, under UN security, relevant uh, UN security, security Council resolutions regarding their ballistic missile program. And beyond that, uh, Iranian behavior overall may actually narrow the gaps that have opened up between the United States and some of the key European players. We have to bear in mind that behind all this is a very dangerous reality. I Iran is not only in the throes of a deadly coronavirus crisis, its economy is now being completely devastated, not only by the sanctions, by the sh but by the sheer uh, collapse of the oil market. And that uh, is no longer just a question of whether or not they're under sanctions. Uh, when, when people are willing to pay uh, in order to have oil taken from them, as we've seen uh, in the uh, Oklahoma stocks the other day, when, when the oil prices basically drop uh, through the, down to the basement and below, uh, below zero, uh, Iran is easily pushed completely out of a market which is already saturated by Saudi Arabia and the Russians, and with uh, international production going uh, to be s remain quite slow for the foreseeable future, mm -hmm. Iran is facing the ruin of its economy, which could bring them to the table or, alternatively, could bring them to a point of lashing out in a very dangerous way. So we face uh, what could be a, a fork in the road right up ahead between Iran coming to its senses or even going the, down on its knees be, under very severe pressure or, quite dangerously, lashing out uh, in a desperate bid uh, to, to win international attention. Indeed. Unfortunately, and, uh, it seems like the latter is uh, the more likely option. And I'd, I'd like to actually uh, uh, ask you, Mr. Oren, at the time when, uh, uh, as Dr. Lehman correctly uh, uh, portrays, Iran is battered when uh, we're talking about its ec economic capacity. Um, it's probably an all-time low since the revolution took place in 79. But uh, specifically, at a time like this, when it uh, goes to the IMF, requests five billion U.S. dollars as uh, humanitarian aid, uh, the Americans, of course, come out and say, "No, we're willing to give you uh, humanitarian aid, but we're not going to give you that money. We're going to give you what you need uh, in order to combat this disease and the spread and, and the challenges presented." Uh, the Iranians go ahead and launch a project that, uh, without all the capacities of uh, the, the world powers, would cost between a quarter to half a billion dollars just to establish the vehicle of delivery without all the, the technological aspects uh, required in order to advance surveillance and so on, which would be another several uh, uh, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. 
how is the Iranian uh, regime even comprehending its capacity to move forward while at the same time it, it, it's continuing with its own uh, activities of malign uh, nature? So, of course, uh, there is a disconnect between the regime and the Iranian people. And uh, the uh, uh, Iranian people um, uh, has been suffering from uh, the consequences of what the regime does. Um, and uh, one uh, problem for the Americans as they look at it is not to raise expectations too much because, uh, of course, uh, the uh, American policy, uh, as stated, is not to move for a regime change, but only to try and change the behavior of the regime. But uh, they would be glad if, uh, uh, for some reason, there was an uprising and uh, people uh, tried to throw the regime out. However, because of the uh, regime's power uh, with the um, uh, Pasadaran, the Revolutionary Guards, with the Basij, with the other uh, tools um, of the uh, regime, uh, which would be very uh, cruel in, and lethal in fighting uh, the masses, uh, it behooves the American administration not to try and foment this dissent, uh, because they will be blamed, the um, uh, counter-revolution could be uh, quashed, and, the, um, and matters uh, would be worse. Now, one has to analyze the situation uh, immediate term, short term, and long term. Immediate term, what you said, um, is, is the right way to analyze it. There is a grave humanitarian and economic uh, crisis. Short term is what we talked about regarding the time between now, between early May and November, the elections. Because if Donald Trump is re-elected, obviously the Iranian leadership will have to reassess and perhaps come to terms with the fact that there is um, a renewed lease on the White House by this administration, they will have to negotiate, which up to now uh, they refuse to. But longer term, the Americans have been saying that, let's say, in 2030 and on, Russia and China are their main rivals, not Iran or even North Korea. If that's the case, why should Russia and China help the United States against Iran? And this is the weak spot in the entire perimeter of American uh, contingency planning, including um, uh, what um, Iran mentioned regarding the, the uh, United Nations. Because Russia and China, of course, can veto whatever resolution the Americans come up with. It will be very difficult for President Trump to try and get some accord from his counterparts in Moscow and Beijing. Being able to establish certain analogies, uh, whenever we're faced with a, a pandemic, we need to try and root out the, the disease or at least establish a certain vaccine in order to uh, uh, combat that disease, uh, in order to find uh, have enough time to find a remedy. Uh, in this situation, the disease in Iran it seems to me, at least, is uh, the Islamic regime, the Ayatollah regime. And the question is, at what stage do we move from trying to find a vaccine to trying to find actually a, a, a remedy that will be able to cure the situation? General Kupel Vassil, it, it seems like the world is not entirely um, uh, understanding with regard to the challenges that are posed here. If we hear uh, Giuseppe Borrell, the EU foreign policy chief, who substituted uh, 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 Federica Mogherini, who was very positive towards uh, her Iranian counterpart, Javad Zarif. Now this uh, Giuseppe Borrell is taking a clear stand against the Americans in favor of the Iranians. What's happening there? Well, the international community is not up to uh, clear confrontation with Iran right now. Uh, the Americans are on this by themselves. They cannot count neither on Russia or China, as you mentioned before, nor on uh, the European Union to, to be on their side. That said, it's not true that they are totally dependent on them in the Security Council in, in this respect, because as one of the people who, uh, one of the groups that uh, are parties to the JCPOA, even though they stopped implementing it, uh, they can still activate the snapback uh, option. And if they do, there's no veto option on, on that uh, move, and this will bring back all the sanctions. The Americans are not uh, very eager to use it because they are afraid that this would mean that they are still 
uh, relying on the agreement in, in a certain way, but if there is no other option, they can still use this option of the snapback. It's, uh, that, uh, that said, I think that uh, the Iranians understand this uh, issue of six months. They believe that it's going to be possible for them to wait those six months. What's happening, as uh, Iran said, about the oil prices, uh, shed some uh, uh, shadow on, on the, the question whether they are really going to be able, because they just don't have any income. Uh, the, the little they had now is shrinking uh, dramatically, and the timetable becomes uh, critical. But at the same time, the United States is also suffering from the coronavirus. So it's uh, the Americans also, even though they keep uh, a certain level of tension and pressure on the on the Iranians, they also are not uh, very uh, eager to, to end up in a war. And as I said before, they are preferring to continue with the maximum pressure and not end up with a war. The, the point is that the, from the point of view of the Iranians, the order of priorities is very clear. First and foremost, they have to keep the regime in place. That's the most important thing. And uh, if this is the case, they need to make sure that, first of all, there is no uprising and they are going to use the, they, they have the tools to, to, to handle this matter. The, the, the siege and the IRGC are uh, quite uh, uh, dependent uh, forces that they can uh, rely upon. Uh, and uh, the second thing that's very important is not to give up while you are keeping your regime in place not to give up your uh, most important assets that has to do with the mission. This is a regime with a mission, and the mission is to spread the, the, the revolution, the Islamic revolution. And that's why it's going to be, that's why they are so deeply involved in the battle about Iraq, which is the main battlefield where the, this uh, issue is, uh, is at stake. There's an attempt to uh, take Iraq away from the Iranians. This is the way they look at it. And uh, they have to defend this uh, crucial asset for them. And uh, this is uh, one, one issue. Second thing is to make sure that uh, they keep the asset of uh, Syria. And, there's a, and this uh, uh, Defense Minister Bennett said, yes, they, we are moving, Israel is moving from uh, just uh, putting uh, pressure and uh, stopping the Iranians from taking uh, Syria over. Now the, the effort is to push them out. So we see an uh, growth in the Israeli activity against the Iranian assets in Syria. This is another issue that is critical for the Iranians. If they uh, have to give up those issues just to, uh, because of the economic pressure they are under, it's going to be a disaster for them. And, uh, and the th third issue, which is not that uh, urgent, is important, but not urgent. Not, you don't have to move right now, is to have the nuclear capabilities uh, to... Uh, uh, support this and these two other efforts. Nevertheless, but this uh, is not critical right, right now. The firing of a ballistic uh, uh, the missile. Firing of ballistic or, missiles. It is one of the pillars in order to attain this uh, nuclear weapons capabilities. I, I would like actually to move, as we don't have very much time left on the program, to Dr. Leoman to hear your take on this. Well, uh, all I can say is that from. Um, our perspective in Israel, but also for uh, for the international community, we are moving into totally uncharted waters. Uh, the The scope of the crisis in Iran, uh, the, the the pressure under which the regime is now, the um, condition, the physical condition of which we know very little uh, of the supreme leader. Um, do they really have, as Yossi Kovovas has said, uh, uh, General Kovovas, do they have the time to wait until November as this pressure uh, intensifies? Or are we sailing into what could become very quickly a, a major regional crisis? We have seen them do very daring and very dangerous things when they attack the uh, Saudi oil facilities. Um, we've heard bravado. Uh, recently from General Salami uh, from the IRGC saying basically, uh, you know, we can go after the American Navy. This is as if they've learned nothing from what happened to them in, 18, in uh, 1989 when they uh, uh, tried to disrupt uh, shipping in the Gulf. The U.S. reflagged some Kuwaiti and other ships. The Iranians uh, created provocations. And within a day, the Iranian Navy ceased to exist. To tamper with the U.S. Navy, which is the most powerful Navy on Earth, um, I think uh, 
it, it tells you something about a mindset in Iran which basically uh, borders on, on, on irresponsibility. Um, so whether they will come to the brink and step back or just go over uh, is not something that we can fully predict. We need to be ready for very severe uh, situations emerging um, quite soon. Indeed. And beyond that, and beyond that, well, quite quickly, if, if Iran continues with its present peeling off of JCPOA elements, we may face a situation where in early 2021 or at some point, in not very distant in time, Israel will start having to think about stopping them by force. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Oren, as we don't have very much time, uh, your closing statement for today's program. Just to uh, expand uh, first on what uh, Iran Lerman just said regarding the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Navy has suffered several blows uh, for for its prestige uh, recently. Uh, it had to do with the Theodore Roosevelt, the uh, aircraft carrier, uh, being uh, hit by the contagion. The captain relieved. Many uh, of the uh, top officials had to resign over the last several months. It is now aching for uh, an effort to renew its glory, and it will be uh, very, very imprudent on the part of the Iranians to try and goad it, and they will they are going to get uh, uh, a severe uh, blow. Uh, on the uh, Israeli part, what is happening uh, following Soleimani's assassination is that the efforts that the IRGC is ma are making are more in Afghanistan and Yemen and Iraq, of course, and less in Syria, which gives Israel more freedom of maneuver there. Because of the character of the commander now in chief of the RGC, who is a lot more indeed. oriented Ka towards, indeed, uh, more oriented towards uh, Afghanistan. This is unfortunately all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank uh, our guests, both uh, Dr. Iran Lerman as well as uh, uh, Brigadier General Yossi, uh, Yossi Kupilvassel for being with us uh, here today, as well as our TV7 analyst here in the studio, Mr. Amir Oren. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. <laughs>